Hello. Thank you for tuning in. This is Eric, a.k.a. Wolf Bitten. I want to thank those of you that have been praying for me. God is good. And those of you that don't know me, um, excuse the little bit of a slur that I might, uh, you might hear on occasion. It's just a side effect from previous stroke. I'm okay. Everything's good. But I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about some things I've been thinking of. The uh, ridiculous gods of atheists and agnostics. And for those of you Christians who have embraced evolution, this is for you too. You know, God would prefer you believe him. I want to go into this a little bit. See, first of all, uh, there's, you know, regardless of the spin, I've debated evolution long enough. I know that there's not a single bit of proof for the theory of evolution. Now, do we have change within species? Of course we do. We have different breeds of dogs and etc. But they're still dogs. As far as crossing certain evolutionary lines, there's no such thing, no evidence for it whatsoever, even in the fossil record. Now, some of them will cry foul at this point, saying, we have transitional fossils. Well, <laughs> no, you don't. You, 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 those of you Christians who have bought into all of this transitional fossil stuff, do you understand the process they go through to determine they have a transitional fossil? They dig up a fossil, experts look at it, and they assign it a place in some lineage with no testing at all. Not a single one. They eyeball it and throw it in somewhere. That's not a test, my friend. That's not science. That's not scientific whatsoever. Luckily, there's a few scientists out there that are honest enough to admit this. Even within the circles of evolution, like the evolutionist uh, Dr. Colin Patterson. He's the former head of the British Museum of Natural History. He's come out and admit you can't test these alleged transitional fossils. There's really no such thing. It's just imagination. But that aside, I want to get to the basic premise of this. The basic premise is the foundational question to, to it all. You know, um, there's a lot of denial going on within the evolutionary circles. And, uh, you know, I, I can debate any aspect of it. But, with atheists and agnostics, I like to take it to the foundational question. It's the simplest and easiest to prove. It's the root of the whole matter. And this is abiogenesis. This is the Shangri-La. This is the lost Ark of the Covenant. For atheists and agnostics, those that believe in evolution. What is abiogenesis? Abiogenesis is the presupposition that life can pop to life from non-life, non-living matter. Acids and proteins and carbon just fall together accidentally in the right degree to and and to form life and it just pops to life one day acids and carbon and proteins fall together and they create a code they create a cell they create a cell that has the potential of being a perfect machine carrying out specific functions and then a code that operates every one of those single functions and allows it to carry out the processes of life. Okay. 
including reproduction, mitosis in the case of single cell organisms, the ability to just split into another one. The only problem is, my friend, you see, this is what they don't want you to know. With all of the computing power that we have, possibly AI at this point working on it, and with all of the uh, brilliant minds that we've got working on this, conducting experiments and trying this and trying that, they have never observed this occurring in nature. And not only have they never observed it occurring in nature, they've never seen it happen in the laboratory. They've never been able to make it happen. So, when you point this out, when you point out this basic flaw and the ridiculousness of abiogenesis, that these carbons and uh, uh, proteins and etc. can just fall together, <laughs> forming a perfect machine, and fall together forming perfect software to operate that machine. And it happens in the same machine, the same little cell, all at the same time. And you point out the fact that this doesn't happen. And they can't make it happen. They try to then separate themselves from abiogenesis and divide abiogenesis from evolution. They say, well, abiogenesis and evolution are two different things. You can't compare it that way. You, you can't bring this up as an argument. Well, yes, my friend, I can. Because, you see, if life never evolved in the first place, then life can't evolve into more complex creatures. For evolution to occur, for the evolution of a single-celled organism to eventually evolve into, you know, animals, pets, dogs, cats, human beings, life had to evolve first from non-living materials previously non-living materials, and that just does not happen. Yes, life had to evolve from non-life before it could evolve into other forms of life. Atheists, agnostics need for abiogenesis to occur before evolution can occur. So yes, they are tied together as one package. Now, Richard Dawkins would want to deny this. Many other evolutionists would deny it. Most of them that I've uh, tried to debate have tried to wiggle out of it, but there's no wiggling out of it. Even Berkeley University agrees with me. The left-wing <laughs> institution, the left-wing institution, Berkeley University, in their Evolution 101 class, agrees with me that yes, abiogenesis is part of the evolutionary process. So, you know, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe Berkeley University or some atheist Joe off the street that says, oh, you can't bring that up? They just don't want to face the truth, my friend. They're denying the facts. Now, why do they do this? They, here's why. An atheist obviously can't embrace creationism. And if they have to try to explain how life began and the failure of abiogenesis in the lab and in nature, the failure to ever observe it or be able to recreate it, then they realize they have no credible third possibility to explain a mechanism that began life in this universe. Now they could say, well, aliens brought it. <laughs> so you're going to deny God and say belief in God is ridiculous, but you're not being ridiculous? Pleading aliens, the aliens did it. 
My friend, get yourself a tin hat. You need it. But let's even give him the alien argument. Okay. Well, those aliens are alive. They had to pop to life somehow, too. Somewhere back the road, you see, you can't go into infinite regression. Somewhere back to lo back the road, um, abiogenesis had to occur on this planet or another one. Wherever you find life, there's proof that either abiogenesis occurred or there's a god that created it. And since we know non-living material doesn't just pop to life on its own, you're being very unscientific by knocking God off the table. See, that's not scientific at all. Science doesn't just throw things off the table. Only bias does that. And biased science is not science at all. You've got to look at the claims. You've got to study them. You've got to test them. You've got to compare them. And the more I studied science and religion, the more I see that science has found God in nearly every discipline you can imagine. Science points to God, a creator. How can I say that? Because only life can bring forth life, my friend. Only life can bring forth life. That's the only thing that we do observe. You see, there is a real science called biogenesis. And biogenesis makes this observation, my friend. But the atheist has to believe in blind faith. That some sort of abiogenesis has occurred. Despite the fact that what we observe says that's an impossible and an unnatural act. What is natural is that life brings forth life. Biogenesis is the study of life, the observation of life. What we do observe is that life has to come forth from a previously existing life, and we never observe it coming about any other day, any other way at all. Not at all. That's the way it happens, my friend. It takes life to create life. Biogenesis teaches that. Observation teaches us that. We're just shooting the straight truth here, my friend. Shooting the straight truth to you, that's all. You see, they don't stop to think of the ridiculous things they're asking us to believe. They don't stop to think about the miracles that they themselves are begging as atheists and agnostics. But it certainly is ridiculous. It's unscientific. It goes against everything we do observe. Not only are they not practicing science, they're denying science. They're denying the things that we observe. You know, once you test an hypothesis, time after 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 time for decades and decades and decades and decades and decades, and you still get the same result, no. Failure. There comes a time you should stop and begin to rethink this, don't you think? Otherwise you're practicing insanity. I'm sure most of you know that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over, hoping for a different result. 
when it just leads to the same failure after failure. Think about this for a minute. You have carbon. You have acids. You have proteins. And they want us to believe that all these things just accidentally fell together in just the right way to create a machine. And the software of that machine. It's like pixie paint spilling into a pile of fairy dust. And each grain just pops to life and it begins to replicate. It eventually evolves into all different kinds of animals, resulting in a human being. And a human creates AI, and AI destroys the world. <laughs> That's the abiogenesis zone. Can you see the ridiculousness of this? Why can't you go by observation? Think of a cell as a machine. Because that's what it is. It's got the hardware, it's got the necessary software built right into it to carry out specific functions and tasks. And just like any programmable machine, it's built to receive and read and understand the coded software. And that coded software is put together in such a way as to take control of all the possible functions of that machine and control them to carry out its jobs, its functions. It's all perfectly compatible. There's... How does that happen accidentally? So... Let's take a look at this. Let's see how these things... These are tiny molecular machines. What? And they are doing this inside your body right now. If you unwind the two strands, you can see that each has a sugar phosphate backbone connected to the sequence of nucleic acid base pairs, known by the letters A, T, G, and C. Now the strands run in opposite directions, which is important when you go to copy DNA. Copying DNA is one of the first steps in cell division. Here, the two strands of DNA are being unwound and separated by the tiny blue molecular machine called helicase. Helicase literally spins as fast as a jet engine. The strand of DNA on the right has its complementary strand assembled continuously, but the other strand is more complicated because it runs in the opposite direction. So it must be looped out with its complementary strand assembled in reverse, section by section. At the end of this process, you have two identical DNA molecules, each one a few centimeters long, but just a couple nanometers wide. So to prevent the DNA from becoming a tangled mess, it is wrapped around proteins called histones, forming a nucleosome. These nucleosomes are bundled together into a fiber known as chromatin, which is further looped and coiled to form a chromosome, one of the largest molecular structures in your body. The process of dividing a cell takes around an hour in mammals, so this footage is from a time lapse. You can see how the chromosomes line up on the equator of the cell. Now when everything is right, they are pulled apart into the two new daughter cells, each one containing an identical copy of DNA. Now, simple as this looks, the process is incredibly complicated and requires even more fascinating molecular machines to accomplish it. For a reason no one's yet been able to figure out, the microtubules are constantly being built at one end and deconstructed at the other. While the chromosome is still getting ready, the kinetochore sends out a chemical stop signal to the rest of the cell, shown here by the red molecules, basically saying this chromosome is not yet ready to divide.
The kinetic ore also mechanically senses tension. When the tension is just right and the position and attachment are correct, all the proteins get ready, shown here by turning green. At this point, the stop signal broadcasting system is not switched off. Instead, it is literally carried away from the kinetic ore down the microtubules by a dynein motor. That's the walking guy. This is really what it looks like. It has long legs so it can avoid obstacles and step over the kinesins, molecular motors that walk in the opposite direction. Personally, I'm astounded by these tiny molecular machines, how they're able to routinely and faithfully execute their functions billions of times over. Do you really think all that just happened accidentally? All of that was created by things just randomly combining the hardware and the software at the same time in the same cell. These things not just pop to life, but they pop to life in huge populations all at once. Things don't happen that way, my friend. They're believing in magic. They're believing in superstition. They might as well be witch doctors. So, no matter what they want you to believe, my friend, it's safe to believe God. Because belief that a living creature, a living being, created life, that's observable. That's something that we can observe. The fact that consciousness only comes forth from conscious creatures, beings, or beings at least with the capability of consciousness. That's, that's provable. That's observable. Biogenesis gives us the observation that makes it safe and a sure bet to believe God created. while biogenesis at the very same time absolutely destroys the theory of evolution. So I want to thank you very much for watching. I look forward to your comments. I look forward to your thoughts. This is Eric, a.k.a. Wolfbitten. Leave me a message. And we, my friend, are out.